Welcome to another edition of Ask the Beer Guy. This is your host, John Griffin, the beer drinking professor. And we talk about the what I'm drinking section this week, and I should say what I'm drinking right now because I've had a lot of different beers this week. And as you may read later on or hear later on on this podcast, I had some Oktoberfest beer that I cooked with, and that happens to be what I was drinking right now. I had some Sam Adams Oktoberfest, which I think is a decent example of an American version of an Oktoberfest. Uh, the, the German versions are definitely a little more authentic, but they're also not catered to the American palate. So Sam Adams Oktoberfest, when it comes out, I tend to drink. I like it. And if you're not sure of the difference between Oktoberfest and Fest beer and, and Merzen and all those others, they're all really related, but... Oktoberfest is really an amber lager that has a lot of malt aroma, and it's usually toasted, and it's from the Vienna or the Munich malt that's used if you're a brewer. It's very clean. There shouldn't be a lot of fruit on it, no hop aroma, no caramel, so just basically toasted malt. So if you think of grape nuts heated up, that would be uh, kind of the the uh, aroma that I that I think of to compare it to. Usually it's a dark gold to deep amber color they you know some people will call it orange red Uh, dark gold to me is a little misleading Uh, there's very few that are that light i would put those under the fest beers which are usually a a little bit darker versions of the munich hellas that are made for beer festivals not necessarily oktoberfest of course they're bright they're they're filtered in most cases unless you're drinking a home brew the the head on it could be a little off white but it should have a fairly decent head retention to it and they start off malty sweet, but they finish kind of dry, which is very typical of a, a well-made German-style beer. So even though they're sweet, the residual sugars are gone, and they end up dry, which makes you want to drink another one, makes you want to eat some food, which is exactly what happens whenever I'm over in Munich or in Germany. I tend to not drink one, but I'm doing it for professional reasons, so that's my excuse. I don't know what yours would be. But there's, they should be toasted, some complexity in the maltiness. Could be some hot bitterness, but a lot of times it may be just a little bit of dark grain that you think is bitter. And you, you might get a little tiny bit of hop flavor, but it's going to be more of a, a floral, noble hop aroma. But definitely the balance is towards the malt. The mouth feel on these is usually medium. I've seen some that are medium light, but they're, they should be a, a medium body. They're not meant to be a summer drinking beer. They're, you know, fall time, festival time, the harvest is over. Should be creamy, medium carbonation, fully fermented. Again, like I say, that's what causes the dryness, and it should not be sweet at the finish at all. That that would be a flaw. I like it. Uh, if you want to try some versions that are not from Sam Adam. There's a lot of different German versions out. Hacker Shore, Oktoberfest, Eyinger is great. Uh, the Pauliner I like. And over at the Freakin' Frog, I actually had the Vorsteiner Oktoberfest on, on draft. And that surprisingly is such a much better beer on draft than in the bottle that if you happen to see it on tap, try it out. Spaten, of course, is another name. Uh, if you're looking for American versions, Gordon Beers has one. They call theirs a Merzen. And if you're back east and you can get Goose Island, try their Oktoberfest. There's nothing like a cold beer. It seems like everybody wants to tax alcohol and especially beer. Whenever there's a crisis, politicians love it because, of course, it's a sin tax. And not sin tax like a programming word, but sin tax as in you're a sinner and you should be taxed for your moronic use of drinking a God-given natural drink. But France is the latest one. Britain had a major problem raising their tax rate earlier the year and many of the pubs and brewers are seeing a significant drop in money but now in france taxes on beer are set to increase by more than 160 percent under a new law being pushed through the french parliament that's what happens when you get uh, socialist presidents in your country so it's supposed to add six cents a glass but the president francois holland he's saying that it's going to raise 480 million euros to invest in social projects for young people and the elderly. And the ministers are there, the goody two-shoes, say it'll help reduce alcohol and tobacco consumption. Trade groups, though, of course, are arguing that it could damage the beer industry. 
reading this article at six cents a glass, you know, when you're paying four to eight dollars for a glass of beer in the European Union, I don't think an extra six cents is going to matter. The reason I would object to it is it's, you know, first it's six cents, then it's ten, then it's a dollar, then it's two dollars, then, well, they can take two, so now it's ten. It's the, the slippery slope. So this particular one, I don't agree that there should be a major problem, but of course, uh, a lot of the owners of bars are, are saying that there's going to be a big problem. This guy, Richard Wilson, who works at the Bower, it's a British pub in Paris, he's telling his employees that it's a bit catastrophic. Uh, industries having problems already. People are drinking at home more, and the bar sector in France is diminishing quite considerably. So it's going to affect us quite badly. Again, I don't see how six cents can make that big a difference. I think it's a societal shift that more and more people want to entertain at home. The economy's bad. They don't want to go out. But it's a good boogeyman, and I don't agree with the tax increase. I think the politicians should spend what they have wisely instead of just saying we need more, more, more. But that's a political question, which I don't really feel like getting into on these Ask a Beer Guy podcasts. But Please let me know what you think. Is six cents this time a big problem going to cause the major collapse in the bar industry in France or, or in anywhere in Europe with these increases in taxes? Do you think these people are just whining? Or do you see it like me that it's going to be a slippery slope that the next time they need money it's going to be a ten cent increase, then twenty, then a dollar? Please let me know at askthebeerguy.com. There's nothing like a cold beer. Looks like even Dr. Oz is getting into the beer world. He's talking specifically to men, which are probably the majority of beer drinkers in the world, even to this day, even though a lot of women are drinking beer. But he's basically talking about bone health, and they find out now that there's a bone-saving secret in brew, and that is silicon. And that's the chemical that stimulates collagen, and collagen's a protein that makes your bones denser or and your joints more flexible. You know, people take uh, glucosamine and chondroitin and that, but now they're finding that drinking beer can actually help your bones. And he's actually advocating beers with a lot of hops and malted barley as being the richest in silicon. So all you Imperial IPA drinkers, keep on drinking. And if anybody says anything, just tell them, hey, basically I'm doing it for my bones. Bananas and brown rice are also high in silicone, so if you can find a way to make a banana brown rice imperial IPA, you could sell it as a health food. And that's my health tip for the day, for the week, for the month. Anyways, you all know that drinking beer is healthy. The hops have been proven to be antiseptic, and we'll talk about some other stuff as the weeks go on, and I dig up some more medical news. There's nothing like a cold beer. Just got an interesting report about Boston Beer, and you may know them as Sam Adams, but on the New York Stock Exchange, their symbol is SAM. They actually reported some really good numbers for the third quarter of 2012 with a net revenue increase of about $31.6 million, or 23% over last year's the same period. They're claiming that's mainly over the core shipment growth of 17%, and the net income was $20.8 million, or $1.53 a share if you happen to have the stock. That's also an increase of $0.34 cents per diluted share uh, from the third quarter of 2011. So it looks like for Sam Adams and the Boston Beer Company, the beer business has been very, very good. And one thing I want to mention to people is they always ask me, especially in class, I always get one or two a semester that, they take my beer class because they want to open up a beer company. And I want to stress that even though some companies do good, there are so many businesses failing in the beer world, just like the restaurant world. The few that are making a lot of money make a ton of money. There's a few in the, you know, making good money. And most of them barely survive. And there's all those that drop off. And the reason I mention that is the beer market's really... It's not an ever-expanding market like people think. In fact, if you followed my blog or my Ask the Beer Guy site, you'll see that beer, in most cases, consumption's gone down in the United States and in most of the world. So you're fighting for a, a bigger piece of a smaller pie, and that takes a lot of money. 
I think I mentioned before I had some guys from out of the country that wanted me to help them with a distribution arrangement in the States, and I turned them down. I basically said, you know, it's almost impossible unless you've got millions of dollars for budget because the competition is so fierce and the big guys have such a big hold on the market. And I'm including more than just the big three. I'm talking about probably the top 100 breweries in the country. They make it very difficult to get shelf space. And, you know, you can go to all the, the free tastings you want and give away all the beer you want. The distributors in many cases don't care. They want you to do all the work for them. So you're going to have to have a, a sales fleet pretty much on your own in each country. Or I'm sorry, in each state. And if you don't, you're probably barely going to make any money. So that's just a little warning from anybody that's really thinking about opening a brewery, especially if you're trying to brew in the package market. So you're, you're bottling and, and canning for sale. If you're going to open a brew pub, that's a different story. That's still a hard road to hoe, as they say. And one thing you might want to think about is you're really opening a restaurant, not a microbrewery, because you have a huge restaurant that happens to sell the beer you make. But there's still opportunity for that because people locally still like big beer. It's just a much harder to get state or, or national distribution, much less international. That's my two cents. If you have any comments and think I'm full of it, please let me know at askthebeerguy.com. There's nothing like a cold beer. I mentioned last week, those of you in Las Vegas, uh, if you were there for Halloween, you could get the last of the Gonzo. I actually had some the other day as well. There's still a little bit left of the 9.2% Gonzo Imperial Porter that's been aged for five years from Flying Dog. So if you happen to be in Vegas, go to the Freaking Frog and get it before it's gone. I also mentioned that there's going to be a special cast number six, which is old engine oil reserve from uh, Clackmanshire, UK. And that got changed. So you still have time. And I know it didn't sell out because the, the date changed, but it's now going to be this Sunday, November 11th, at 6 o'clock at the Freakin' Frog. It's 45 bucks a person, and you don't want to miss this bucket list. There's no, never going to be another chance for you to have it. Uh, it's a classic and intense jet black stout, and should be on anybody's list, any beer drinker's list, as I mentioned in the last podcast. So if you need more info, go to Freakin' Frog. That's F-R-E-A-K-I-N-F-R-O-G.com, or you can call them. At 702-217-6794, I highly, highly recommend being there this Sunday for the Engine Oil Reserve. If you're there, let me know. I wouldn't mind talking to you and seeing what you think. There's nothing like a cold beer. I've been doing a lot of cooking with beer lately, and uh, one of the things I like to do is convert recipes that I find and add beer to them. And the other day I happened to be at the local store, and they had a nice big pork butt roast with the bone in it on sale about half price it was expiring that day but it was vacuum packed so I didn't really worry about it being old I just know that you can buy some stuff that's on the last day and it lasts a couple weeks especially when it's vacuum packed so I decided to do that and this is a really simple recipe I love the crock pot because a it makes the house smell awesome and b you don't have to sit over the stove so for those lazy cooks it's great you can start something in the morning for those of you that aren't lazy but just like cooking and you just want to do a nice slow cook, crock pot's great for that or the slow cooker. So what I did was take this pork roast and did a really simple uh, thing with it. I had about four big leeks that I bought also on sale at the same day. Cut off the green part and uh, got the sand out of them. Throw those in the Cuisinart along with about 10 or 12 cloves of garlic. You can use more or less depending on what you want. Minced those up really nice, took all of about 30 seconds, threw that in the bottom of the slow cooker, and then I salt and peppered them a little bit just to get a little flavor. I also salt and peppered the pork butt roast and threw that on top of the leek and garlic mixture. And then I took one bottle that I had of some Oktoberfest beer and I used a amber lager for a reason. And that was because I was looking for a little bit of character from the beer, but I didn't want something dark with chocolatey and coffee or burnt notes in it that a, that a darker beer would have given me. But I also wanted a little bit of some nutty sweetness or, you know, beer character that I probably wouldn't have got from a light lager. You could use an amber ale as well. In fact, you could probably use almost any beer, but like most cooking, 
you don't want a highly hop beer because that hop character may not go well with the beer, or I'm sorry, may not go well with the food. So I threw all that in there, uh, put the top on, and six to eight hours later, it was done, fall apart good, threw it on a toasted piece of a Kaiser roll with some mayonnaise, actually I think it was a Mexican bolillo roll, or a Tolero roll, and uh, ate that up. The rest of the family loved it, they just ate it plain. So it's a great thing for sandwiches or as a meal. So try that. It's on the website at askthebeerguy.com. There's nothing like a cold beer. Today's homebrew geek lesson and beer lesson is going to be about yeast. And I'm not going to try and make this the be-all and end-all about yeast because yeast is probably one of the most complicated parts of the brewing cycle. I just want to go over some general concepts and maybe help people understand what yeast is, how it affects uh, beer, and especially home brewers. So, as most of you know, there's lager beer and there's ale beer, and of course there's Belgian. I mean, that's more of a flavor profile as opposed to a type. So, there's lager, there's ale, and there's also what we might call hybrids, which might be warmly fermented lager or cool fermented ale. In the case of Scottish beer, that would be like a a cool fermented ale yeast. In the case of a California Common or Anchor Steam type beer, that would be a warm fermented lager yeast. But what does yeast do? Uh, a lot of people understand that it eats the sugar in a beer, but the two byproducts that really most people know about are CO2 and alcohol. But there's a lot more that goes on with that. And there's esters, there's phenols, there's uh, diacetyl, which I'll talk about in the question this week, uh, flocculation, attenuation. There's also more than the two normal types of, of yeast, which are the, the lager and the ale. There's also uh, yeast that aren't really even in the same genus as the normal, what people think of as yeast. There's bretomyces, if they're for lambics, or lambic, if you want to pronounce it uh, more professionally. But the main thing to understand is in the two types of yeast, and that's what I'll concentrate on today, is ale versus lager, is the temperature difference. Lager yeast is fermented cooler, so generally below 60 degrees, usually in the 50s, 55, 50 degrees. Uh, and ale yeast are fermented warmer, usually 68 to 72, but it could be anywhere from 65 to maybe 80 on a, on a Belgian yeast. Uh, all yeast, even lager yeast, they'll ferment higher, but they put out more and more byproducts. And the byproducts are the flavor profiles in yeast, but those flavor profiles can be good and they can be bad. So by fermenting your lager yeast really warm, you're going to get a lot of off flavors or things that don't seem beer-like. That it, you know, the, the yeast are just doing their thing, but they're more accustomed to being cool and they breed slower, their metabolism slower, and they tend to be a lot cleaner. So when we think of lager yeast, we think of clean, crisp, refreshing beer. You know, it doesn't have to be yellow, fizzy water. You know, there's lagers that are dark. There's lagers that are amber. Oktoberfest, which I was drinking, is really an amber lager. You can get Schwartz beer, which is a dark lager. So basically, you can see by keeping the same grain bill and the same hop load, just changing the yeast and the temperature of fermentation is going to create a completely different beer. Ale yeast is warm fermented, so it's known for more esters, more phenols, more byproducts. But one advantage it has is there's less diacetyl. And diacetyl is the popcorn butter type flavor and aroma, and it's generally a flaw. Although ales, uh, especially some English ones, it is okay, but it shouldn't overpower the beer. And also in uh, Czechoslovakian style pilsners, they don't get rid of the diacetyl either. But in general, most beers, you don't want any noticeable diacetyl. And the way the lager brewers get rid of it is they warm their yeast up for a couple of days when the, when it's almost fermented out to raise the temperature to 65 degrees or so, and the yeast reactivate. They get more active, and when they get more active, they start to clean up their own mess, you could say. Ale yeast is fermented warmer, but at the same time, as we talk about in our question that's coming up, you still need to let the fermentation process continue. You know, if you cut off fermentation and just start cleaning everything up, you're not allowing the yeast to clean up after itself. So that's a good 
thing to know is, you know, even if your beer may ferment out in three days, if it's an ale, let it sit another week or two. It's not going to hurt anything and it's only going to clean itself up. Another thing we talk about is flocculation, and that's the ability of, of the yeast to clump together and, and maybe fall out of suspension. And lager yeast tend to not flocculate uh, to the top. They tend to, to just fall down to the bottom, which is why you'll hear lager being called a bottom fermented yeast. That doesn't mean the yeast is at the bottom fermenting. It really means that the yeast have a tendency to drop out of suspension or flocculate out well. Ale yeast, on the other hand, tends to be top fermenting or, you know, tend to, to clump together at the top of the uh, fermenter that you're using. So that's how you get those terms. I'll go into flocculation and attenuation when we get into serious home brewing and how you can tweak your yeast out and those kind of things. You'll also hear about attenuation, and that's the ability for the yeast to eat all the sugar that's available. And there's certain sugars that can't be eaten by ale yeast, raffinose is one. But in general, a highly attenuating yeast tends to consume more of the sugars that are typical in a, in a wort or a, in a beer. And low attenuating uh, would leave more of a mouthfeel and have obviously less alcohol because there's more sugar left in the beer. So a brewer doesn't just pick ale and lager yeast. They also pick based on the flocculation characteristic, the attenuation. And, you know, one case where you may want a yeast that doesn't fall out of suspension easily or clump together is a Hefeweizen, especially the German style or the Belgian wit beers where you have an unfiltered beer, but you part of the style is actually to have that yeast in suspension. That's why they're cloudy. Nobody filters it. But if the yeast was highly flocculating, it would just drop to the bottom and it would still be pretty much a clear beer, and that's not what you want. So there is a lot of consideration into that. And I want to clear up another myth. You know, a lot of people say, oh, yeast wasn't discovered until Louis Pasteur or right around that time. But it actually, the first known instance that I could find was 1674 when Anthony Van Leeu, Hoke, Leeu and Hoke, discovered yeast. So that was a long time. That was in the Middle Ages. They probably didn't know a lot about it at the time. They just knew it existed. And in 1837, Theodore Schwann discovered that yeast metabolizes sugar. He's the actual one who named it Saccharomyces. Bottom fermenting, really lager brewing, began in 1841 with a guy named Gabriel Settlemeyer in Munich and then in his counterpart in Vienna, Anton Dreher. And then it wasn't until 1850 that Louis Pasteur came really close to isolating yeast. And finally, Louis Pasteur and Buckner revealed that alcohol was a byproduct of carbon metabolism of yeast involving zymase. And then the famous Carlsberg Brewery in Copenhagen was the first ones to actually finally isolate lager yeast, and that was Emil Hansen in 1881. So you can see brewers have known about yeast, and it for a long time, but it's still like a black art. There's constant research going on, whereas malting and those things are pretty well known. There's some innovation that happens, but basically yeast is still the black magic of the brewing world, so it's going to pay to understand how yeast not only affect the flavor, but also how the brewer picks a certain yeast. And I hope that helps, and if you have any questions or comments, please let me know at askthebeerguy.com. There's nothing like a cold beer. I got a question from Sarah this week, and it says, Is there any way to control the production of diacetyl? And if you don't know what diacetyl is, it's usually a flaw in most styles, but it's the butter, butterscotch, you know, artificial popcorn type butter that you would get at the movie theater <clears throat> flavor. There's sometimes an aroma of butter as well. And it, the threshold's pretty low, so if you have it in your beer, a lot of people can taste it fairly easily. I happen to be one of the two-thirds of the country that has a really hard time tasting it unless it's a pretty high concentration. But there's an easy test for it, and that's slickness on the roof of your mouth. So if you, if you rub your tongue on the roof of your mouth, you'll feel the slickness there. That means there's some diacetyl. If it you know, feels normal, it's kind of not dry because it's obviously watery, but... It sticks instead of it is slippery. 
then you'll know you may have a diastole problem. If you can smell butter or you can really taste it, the mouthfeel's going to get buttery, uh, then you'll know you have a problem. And one of the things that I've been studying a lot about is yeast production and how yeast affects beer. And I've always said the best thing a home brewer can do is if there's one way to improve your beer above all others it's t- is temperature control and that's because of the yeast hate fluctuation and as we talked about yeast in the earlier section you can see how important yeast are to your beer so one advantage of temperature control is the yeast tend to metabolize their own diacetyl and home brewers tend to have this mentality that yeast is an evil thing and as soon as their beer is fermented out they drop the yeast freeze it filter it rack it over or whatever when in reality what they should be doing is waiting another week or two before they even lower the temperature because even at ale temperatures the yeast even though they may not be fermenting any sugars they are getting rid of some byproducts and Chris White in his book Yeast talks a lot about how diacetyl production occurs and you know if you think about it from a lager point of view they raise the temperature up to 65 degrees or so for a couple days and that reactivates the yeast and they start to eat their own byproducts. And one of the, uh, the lagering effects is even though the temperature is low, the yeast isn't dead yet. So if your beer isn't filtered out of yeast, the, the yeast will slowly, very slowly eat uh, the, the byproducts, including diacetyl. Uh, but it's still better not to just crash your yeast. And I, if the, I hate to stress this, but... Most home brewers have some weird obsession with yeast that if your beer stays on the yeast for more than, you know, two days after it's fermented, and I'm exaggerating there, but I've actually had some people that are, you know, they'll measure their te- their uh, final gravity two or three times a day, and as soon as it gets to what they think it should be, they rack the beer or they'll crash it down in a 30-degree 35 degree refrigerator and that is one way to guarantee that you're going to have not only diacetyl but other byproducts so again temperature control and understanding how yeast works will really help your homebrew so i hope that answers your question sarah thank you for listening to the ask the beer guy podcast if you have any questions or want to sign up for notifications about beer news please make sure you visit askthebeerguy.com there's a form there don't worry we don't spam so Enjoy the podcast and hope to see you next week.